Thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, Dr. Chamaro Garcia is an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology and Environmental Toxicology uh, at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She received her PhD in biochemistry and biomedicine from the Universidad Autonoma of Madrid, Spain, and received postdoctoral training at the University of California, Irvine, where she investigated how exposure to environmental pollutants contribute to transgenerational metabolic disruption. She started her independent research program at UCSC in 2019, where she is investigating mechanisms of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance upon exposure to environmental agents at critical windows of susceptibility, such as during pregnancy and before conception. So, as I believe Alana mentioned, this work was funded from one of our Earth Center RAP grants. I believe this was from our first cycle. And Dr. Chamaro Garcia used the center's proteomics core for her project. Dr. Susan Fisher, who directs the core for us, will also, I hope, be uh, able to provide a little bit of background on that. So, with that, let me hand it over to you, Raquel. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Peggy, and for, you know, uh, thank you to Alana that organized everything and uh, for inviting me to, to talk about the work that we are doing. So I will definitely talk about the project that uh, was funded uh, by their center. Uh, but before I get there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background or of uh, talking about where I come from, uh, where my research program comes from. And then I will talk about the project their center pilot project, and then I will uh, tell you a little bit about where we are going uh, from there. So the work that my lab is interested in is in understanding how environmental exposures affect uh, human health and in the context of multigenerational uh, diseases. Uh, I have here like a subtitle regarding uh, the lifestyle before conceiving. Why does it matter? Uh, because this is kind of like a direction, a new direction that my project, my research program is going into. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I think, you know, the audience in this um, presentation is very aware about the concept of the exposome. But given the nature of my research, I cannot a skip uh, a slide talking about the exposome. So as many of you probably uh, are familiar with, the exposome refers to all those exposures that every individual is um, uh, exposed to uh, throughout life from conception until death. And they include many different factors. Uh, some of them are associated more with uh, social factors like uh, our social capital, household income, uh, our lifestyle choices, and the ecosystem, uh, our community, uh, uh, the properties of our community and how it may be affecting us. Some of them refer more to physical and chemical factors uh, that uh, we are exposed to. And that is actually the focus of my research program. Uh, so all these factors don't act just on their own. So they interact with each other. So it is very um, sometimes unfair to actually isolate each of them differently. But uh, given the nature of our research, uh, sometimes we that's the only thing that we can do to actually isolate each of the factors that we are interested in to trying to understand how they are affecting our health. So everything is a lot more complex and um, uh, because of all these interactions. And also, if we are also introduce the unique uh, characteristics characteristics of the individuals that are exposed to this uh, exposome. Uh, so everything involves like a, a lot of different um, pieces that we need to try to integrate all together to understand how the environment can be affecting our health. Uh, so, you know, even though we know and there is a lot of discussion uh, in, in the news about uh, how we are exposed to all these chemicals and now we know more about how they can affect our health, uh, even though we try to reduce our exposure, is actually um, pretty much impossible to reduce, uh, to completely remove the exposure to all these environmental factors. So we are exposed 
uh, from uh, the food that we are uh, eating uh, because uh, different chemicals are added uh, in the processing of these foods. Uh, there is uh, there are chemicals uh, present uh, due to industrial activity in personal and home care products. Uh, we also uh, find these chemicals, and even when we get sick and we go to the doctor, the medical care products are also um, they contain some of these chemicals that are known to have uh, detrimental effects on our health. So I think it is important that we keep all these factors in, in, in mind. And, you know, the more we learn about how these chemicals are affecting our health, uh, the more we see information about it in the news and how there are new regulations trying to restrict or to ban some of these chemicals uh, that are known to have detrimental effects in human health. And I think this is great. This is like a starting point to actually draw attention towards uh, this uh, concern. But a point that I want to make is that decades of exposure of certain chemicals can have long-lasting effects, not only in the exposed individuals, but also to be passed to unexposed generations. So I think the fact that we are restricting the use of certain chemicals or are banning certain chemicals um, is not just a, a, a point to actually forget about them. We, we, we actually perhaps are uh, still uh, carrying uh, alterations that are due to these um, exposures and that can be passed to our future generations and have uh, negative effects in, in our future um, uh, population. So, you know, I just wanted to bring that uh, to our attention because I think it's great that policymakers are working on that and politicians are working on that, but we shouldn't forget about, you know, all the long lasting effects that we can have due to these exposures. So the first person that actually um, found an association between environmental exposures and multi-generational disease was actually Michael Skinner back in 2005. They published this uh, seminal work in science where they were associating endocrine disruptive in chemicals and fertility, uh, infertility uh, in later generations. And after that, there have been a number of studies, including some of my own, where we were studying different chemicals, different environmental factors in different models, including rodents and um, uh, worms and fruit flies that are actually showing how ancestral exposure to environmental factors can contribute to disease in future generations. However, even though we have been working in this field for around 15 to 20 years, um, we still have some key knowledge gaps. Uh, there are some questions that we haven't answered yet. And some of them that I am listing here are the ones that I am excited about and that my research program is focusing in. So one of them is, what are the initial alterations that occur upon exposure to environmental factors? that can contribute to multi-generational disease? How are those alterations propagated across generations? And whether different environmental exposures lead to similar endpoints via similar mechanisms of action. So we have seen different chemicals leading to similar adverse health effects, but we have never uh, connected uh, the mechanisms of action because we still don't understand uh, these mechanisms of action. So, when we talk about multi-generational disease and environmental exposures, uh, it is uh, kind of like mandatory to think about epigenetics. So when we think about it, uh, it comes to mind alterations in DNA methylation, alterations in histone modifications, the contribution of non coin RNAs to actually regulate or misregulate the expression of the genome, and that can lead to different um, diseases. I want to talk today to you about uh, alterations in higher order genome organization. And, and this refers on how the genome is being compacted in the nucleus. So we sometimes think about it I, as a random way of having the genome all wrapped up in, in the nucleus. But we know now that there is some sort of organization uh, within the nucleus. And just to simplify this uh, explanation, everything is a lot more complex than what I'm going to say. But uh, just uh, in order to simplify it, I'm moving on with the talk, I'm just going to highlight the fact that there has um, there is an, um, uh, an identification of two different compartments, compartment A and compartment B, that are associated with either euchromatin or chromatin that is uh, more open and uh, that contains genes that can be um, more actively expressed. And the compartment B is more represented by heterochromatin and that contains genes that are less actively expressed. 
Uh, compartment A tends to be in the center of the nucleus and compartment B tends to be in the periphery of the nucleus. So of course, as I said, everything is a lot more complex than that, but um, I just wanted to give you like a little bit of background on this because it's going to be important for uh, the next steps in my talk. So one of the issues that we have when we think about multigenerational disease and uh, epigenetic uh, alterations is that there is this process called epigenetic reprogramming that occurs during embryonic development that involves the erasure and then the reestablishment of these epigenetic marks, including DNA methylation and uh, hist different histone modifications. So when it comes to explaining how um, environmental factors can alter epigenetic signatures in one generation and how that can be passed to future generations, uh, we have like a key uh, question mark in what happens during epigenetic reprogramming, because if everything is erased, how can it be reestablished um, in the wrong way uh, after um, in the next generation? So, you know, these challenges are actually, uh, we've, my lab finds them like very exciting and it's something that we are actually trying to tackle in the research that we are doing. So as I was saying, my research program is trying to investigate these three questions in the context of environmental epigenetics and metabolic disease. So metabolic disorders are important because they are becoming a global problem. So if we looked at, uh, if we look at the evolution of uh, metabolic disorders like obesity of, or type two diabetes over the last 50 years, there has been a dramatic increase in um, the prevalence of these disorders. So in this case, I'm showing here, here a map from the mid seventies about the percentage of obese adults uh, in different countries in the world. So as you can see here in the legend, uh, the average uh, obese population all over the world was around 10%. Flash forward to 2016, we are seeing a dramatic increase in this percentage. And in some countries, this uh, per percentage is over 40%, including the United States. So it is very important to um, keep uh, these factors uh, in mind because uh, obesity and other metabolic disorders can uh, bring uh, a significant uh, amount of um, economic investment uh, to actually um, address these issues. So there is an estimation of $2 trillion annual uh, cost uh, worldwide to actually treat uh, obesity and uh, other metabolic disorders. But there is also a social cost associated to it because there are developing countries that cannot afford these expenses. There are racial disparities in the proportion of people that are suffering from these disorders. And there is also a lot of stigma around it. So it is important to understand what are the factors that are contributing to these um, disorders, metabolic disorders. Disorders. So traditionally, we have thought about um, metabolic diseases in the context of genetics, like there may be gene genes that can explain why some people are more or less susceptible to certain diseases. And recent work has demonstrated that only 3% of the cases of obesity cases uh, can be explained by genetic factors. We also know that there are other factors like diet, exercise, the microbiome, stress that can actually contribute to metabolic disruption, obesity, type 2 diabetes um, during adulthood. Uh, we know now that the environment we are exposed to during in utero development can also contribute dramatically to uh, metabolic disorders in future in the offspring. So smoking during pregnancy or, or poor nutrition has been associated with um, obesity in the offspring. And uh, because of the work of a lot of us, uh, now we also know that the environment our ancestors were exposed to um, uh, can also uh, have an impact in future generations. So one example that I want to show regarding human exposures is the, the, the Dutch famine study. So uh, this uh, Dutch famine took place in the Netherlands uh, at the end of World War II where there was a dramatic shortage in food um, uh, during uh, that period of time. So in this uh, graph here on the right, uh, it is represented here in this column, uh, it is represented the desire um, 
amount of calories that an adult should be taking every day. Of course, during the war, there was a reduction in the calories that were uh, available um, for this population. But uh, in the winter of uh, 1944 and 1945, there was a dramatic decrease in the amount of calories that could be um, that was taken by the population in this community. So something that was very extraordinary about this study is that there were really good medical records of the population, and that included pregnant women uh, in, in this area. So uh, something that uh, came up uh, by doing the analysis of this data was that uh, the exposure to famine during preconception periods or at different stages during pregnancy led to adverse health outcomes in the offspring. And this Adverse health outcomes included different metabolic dis disorders like obesity or type 2 diabetes, uh, infertility, behavioral um, disorders, and also a uh, general increased adult mortality. More interestingly, uh, there was a, a, this study took place over a, a couple of generations now, and a, information coming from the second generation showed that in general, that second generation had poor health. So when we think about what are the elements that are contributing to this multigenerational inheritance, eh, traditionally we have thought about genetics. And eh, if that were the case, we would expect eh, one environmental perturbation, like in this case, uh, famine, eh, will lead to one or a few eh, mutations that eh, by eh, following Mendelian laws uh, will uh, lead to one particular phenotype. However, what we are seeing in the Dutch famine is that this environmental perturbation is altering in ways that we still don't exactly understand um, the, the offspring, and that is leading to very diff to different uh, um, adverse health outcomes. So here is where epigenetics comes to play. And actually, a few years later, you know, there, there has been there have been many studies, uh, many published uh, investigating this cohort. And a few years ago, there was an association between alteration of DNA methylation signatures uh, uh, with the famine and a disease in the offspring of these um, of these mothers uh, that were exposed to the famine back in that time. Um, so epigenetics seems to be uh, present uh, also in human populations. And uh, so, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it has been shown that environmental factors can alter the epigenome uh, in human populations, and that can explain to some extent uh, how um, environmental factors can contribute to disease in future generations. So what I am interested in is actually understanding how chemicals are, are um, uh, leading to this type of uh, multigenerational diseases. And there have been a number of people working in uh, with human cohorts and uh, how uh, environmental exposures to certain chemicals, kind of like uh, arsenic here is an example, uh, how they are affecting DNA methylation in the next generation after exposure of the um, uh, parents. So, uh, as you can imagine, working with human population is very difficult and challenging. So I'm trying to uh, go to basic research and work with animal models and um, contribute to the field by trying to understand how environmental factors are contributing to multigenerational metabolic disruption. So when I started in the field, I started working with tributyltin or TBT. And uh, this chemical is found in the environment and is used as an antifolding agent in paints and wood preservatives. Uh, it is a thermal stabilizer and it has been found recently in house dust and in human blood. So it is present in the environment, we are exposed to it. And um, in paints, um, it, it, it has an important uh, function because it actually um, prevents uh, mollusks uh, uh, from attaching to the boats, uh, which can actually improve the life of the boats. Uh, however, it has a, a detrimental effect in marine life. So TBT has been regulated its use, but as I was uh, pointing out in at the beginning of the talk, the fact that it has been regulated doesn't mean that we are not seeing the effect of TBT in our cells. So something that was found in the lab before I started this project is that TBT induces lipid storage in cell culture, and it induces fat tissue development in mice. Uh, 
So something that I wanted to know was uh, whether TBT induces transgenerational obesity. So I developed this uh, multi-generational, transgenerational um, uh, experimental setup uh, inspired by Michael Skinner's uh, work and the work of many other people. Uh, so what we did was to actually expose pregnant moms to TBT and analyze multiple generations. And in this context of exposure during pregnancy, we are not only exposing the F0 um, a pregnant female, but we are potentially also exposing the first generation that is developing and also the second generation in the form of the primordial gem cells that are going to lead to the oocytes and the sperm that will lead to the second generation. So the first generation that hasn't, that we know for sure hasn't seen TBT uh, will be the third generation. And any effect that is found in the third and subsequent generations can be considered transgenerational. So a little bit more information about the experimental design. We used uh, black six mice. We used low levels of TBT, uh, environmentally relevant concentrations of TBT. And something that I wanted to mention here is that we expose um, females, F0 females for one week before mating. And the idea back then was to actually have TBT in the system when we were mating the animals. Uh, and um, even though now I think that was very naive for me to think this way, I didn't think that that could have an effect. This pretreatment couldn't have an effect. Of course, now we know better, and I will talk about it in a few slides. So something that we found in this study was that in the F3 and the F4 generations, these animals accumulated significantly more fat. Uh, they were uh, they had larger fat cells, uh, which can affect the function of these cells, and it also uh, we also found accumulation of fat in the liver tissue. So a follow up study um, that we performed was to actually took a uh, four generation animals and exposed them to four generation of animals that were ancestrally exposed to tributyltin and then uh, expose them to a high fat diet. So the animals were grown on a standard diet and then at some point we switched the diet to a high fat diet and then for a few weeks and then we uh, remove, return the animals into the standard diet. So what we found in males was that the animals that were ancestrally exposed to TBT that is represented here in with the dotted line uh, accumulated significantly more fat than the control animal that are, is the solid line. When we looked into females, we see a slight uh, a separation, but it is not uh, statistically significant following like the standard statistical approaches um, um, uh, for uh, this type of analysis. However, when we looked into the metabolomic profiling of these uh, animals, we found that um, the uh, in both sexes, males and females, there was um, a significant difference, a significant separation uh, of the different groups. So here we have with light and dark blue, two different concentrations of tributyltin. And in green, uh, it is represented DMSO, that is the control. So in males, all the groups are separating pretty well. And also in females, we are seeing a good separation. So even though we are not seeing a phenotype from the fat content and a perspective, when we look into the metabolomic perspective, we are indeed seeing an effect um, of the ancestral exposure to tributyltin. So we kind of have like a sexually dimorphic phenotype uh, in this, um, um, in this um, study. So the next question was related about, okay, so what is going on in these animals that can explain the phenotype that we are having? So we decided to actually study um, fat tissue uh, from males, and then, oops, sorry, um, a, analyze DNA methylation and gene expression. And our whole idea was that DNA methylation will be altered and a, it will be associated with changes in gene expression uh, of relevant genes a, for uh, metabolism. So we did methylome and transcriptome analysis in F4 generation in fat tissue and analyzed uh, and looked for associations between alterations in the methylation state of promoters and alterations in the gene expression of those genes. However, we didn't find any. So that was a little bit um, disheartening. However, something that we found 
was a very interesting pattern in the distribution of the differentially methylated uh, regions or DMRs. So this uh, is just a representation of chromosome seven. And in blue, it is represented hypomethylated DMRs. Uh, so that would be hyper, hypomethylated in TBT compared to DMSO. And in red, I'm showing hypermethylated DMRs hypermethylated in TBT compared to the MSO. So if you I, I, if you I notice, there are some regions where there are only hypomethylated uh, DMRs and other regions where there are only hypermethylated DMRs. So we decided to call these regions either hyper or hypo isodirectional differentially methylated blocks or isoDMBs and then perform further analysis to see whether genes that are located within those regions uh, had um, a, a changes in gene expression that could explain the phenotypes that we were seeing. So we divided the whole genome into either hyper or hypo isodMBs, sorry, hyper or hypo methylated isodMBs, and uh, then analyze the genes that were contained in these regions. And actually something that we found is that uh, those um, genes that were located in hypomethylated regions tended to be overexpressed and genes located in hypermethylated regions tended to be underexpressed. So it was following the DNA methylation dogma uh, of regulation of the gene expression. When we did functional analysis of those genes, we actually found an enrichment in genes that were involved in um, a, a meta metabolism. Uh, so uh, there was a glucolysis present, a Fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation, but also, you know, uh, genes like leptin that is very important in regulating uh, obesity and fat content was also altered um, due to the ancestral exposure to TBT. So um, this was a uh, very interesting, uh, and we found we were very excited about these findings. But we were also kind of like. Um, puzzle about this distribution of the DMRs, how there were some regions where there were only DMRs um, that were hypomethylated and DMRs that were only hypermethylated. So um, Carlos uh, Diaz Castillo, uh, who was collaborating with us back then and now is a member in my lab, came up with this uh, idea about the potential alteration of nuclear genome organization due to the exposure to um, this an ancestral exposure to TBT. So to actually tackle that question to whether tributylene could be altering nuclear genome organization, uh, we will have had uh, uh, to use like methodologies, uh, including high c or other proximity ligation methods to analyze a uh, nuclear genome architecture. However, we didn't have samples prepared from this study that is a very long study uh, to actually do those type of analysis. So Carlos came up with the idea of using isocores. So isocores are large regions of the DNA uh, that have like very highly uh, homogeneous base composition. So they are uh, enriched on GC content or AT content. Uh, they reflect multiple levels of organization, including um, topology-associated domains, euchromatin and heterochromatin, or compartment A and compartment B. So it was a, a good approach with the material that we had to actually um, tackle this nuclear genome organization question. So the isocores, uh, are, there are five types of isocores. L1 and L2 are low in GC content, and then H1, H2, and H3 are higher in GC content. And they represent compartment B with low GC content and compartment A with high GC content. So we took tissues from uh, that were available to us. So uh, we had fat tissue, liver tissue, MSCs that are mesenchymal stem cells that are the precursors of the fat tissue. And we have samples from males and females. So we analyzed methylome and transcript transcriptome, and then we use isocores to actually analyze this data. So, uh, uh, well, something important about isocores is that they are invariable across tissues and generations and sexes. So that is one way uh, that allowed us, that uh, one uh, property that allowed us to use the same methodology with all the different tissues and both sexes in this, um, in this analysis. So we uh, did analysis of, of these genomic traits, methylation and transcription with regards to isocores before and after randomly rearranging, re rearranging data sets uh, 10,000 times. So 
just to orient you, I'm going to show you a few graphs that are looking somewhat like this. So uh, here in the uh, x-axis, you can see the different isocores, L1, L2, H1, H2, and H3. And uh, what is represented here is the bias of the expression of the genes on these different isocores. So for instance, in this, oops, sorry, in this representation, um, the, there is a bias in the overexpression of genes that are located in the uh, heterochromatic heterochromatic region L1 and L2, and uh, because it is above the zero line. So if it is below the zero line, that would mean that it is significantly lower uh, expression the genes uh, of those regions of the genome. In this case, it is represented the euchromatin um, isocores. Uh, Euchromatin uh, regions, which are uh, isocores H2 and H3. And then anything that uh, spans the zero line is not significant. So again, we took these tissues and we did this type of analysis, and this is the data that we observed. So uh, here on the left, the two first graphs are representing F3 and F4 female MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells. And if uh, you notice, they have like a very similar pattern of distribution of the bias of the expression of the genome. So uh, genes that are located in L1 and L2 isocores tend to be overexpressed. And genes that are located in um, the euchromatic region ten tends to be underexpressed. So there is a conservation between the two generations on uh, the genes that are how the genes are being expressed depending on the location in the genome. When we look into emesis in males uh, here uh, in these two panels, we also see a conservation between the F3 and F4, but actually if you notice the pattern is different. So the overexpression occurs in the genes that are located in uh, euchromatic regions, and the underexpression uh, occurs in those genes that are located in the heterochromatic region. So we hypothesize that that kind of explains the um, sexually dimorphic phenotype that we were observing. And another important observation is that when we look into the comparison between emesis and fat tissue, GWAT here, uh, we actually see a similar pattern in males, uh, which uh, kind of makes sense, uh, or it is exciting to us actually, because uh, MSCs are the precursors uh, to um, a, a fat tissue. So that means that there is kind of like a conservation of the bias of how the genome is being expressed depending on the tissue. When we look into liver tissue that is represented here on the far right, it actually follows the opposite trend. So there is a bias in how the genome is being expressed, but in opposite directions compared to uh, liver tissue and MSCs. So the overall conclusion that we had from this, that we took from this um, analysis is that ancestral exposure to tributyltin leads to alterations of nuclear genome organization, how the uh, genome is being expressed, but it has a sexually dimorphic way of doing so, and is also dependent on ontogeny. So the liver uh, tissue it has a different embryonic uh, ontogeny compared to MSCs and uh, fat tissue. So another observation that we made was to actually try to locate where metabolic genes were in the genome. So uh, naively, on my part, at the beginning, I thought that the genes would be located wherever in the whole genome. But when we looked carefully about uh, where these metabolic genes were located, we actually found here is represented in the light blue that genes involved in metabolic processes are overrepresented in euchromatic regions uh, uh, as opposed to heterochromatic regions. So when there are alterations of nuclear genome organization, if there is also a bias on where the genes are located, we will expect to see alterations or an overall alteration of how these genes are being expressed that can explain the phenotype that we are seeing in the F3 and the F4 generation. Interestingly, because the hypothesis that we had is that there is an alteration on nuclear genome organization, we also found the same bias when we looked into genes that are involved in chromatin organization and chromosome organization. So this brought us uh, to our hypothesis that the ancestral exposure 
exposure to tributyltin leads to changes in higher order chromatin organization that can subsequently alter changes in DNA methylation and changes in gene expression. So this helped us uh, proposing a new model on how these alterations are propagated from one generation to the next. So we are kind of like walking walk, uh, backwards. So we have information about what happens in the F3 and the F4, but we still don't know how we reach that point. So based on this idea of having alterations of uh, in a, a, a chromatin organization, we are proposing this model of self-reconstruction. So let me walk you through it. So uh, in a, a regular status with no exposure to environmental factors, we will have um, a particular um, um, organization of the genome. So here the blue and the red lines are representing eight, AT enriched DNA and GC enriched DNA or uh, the different compartments. And uh, there will be genes located in those regions um, that are going to be uh, expressed normally. So these uh, oval uh, genes are representing metabolism, the squares are represented chromatin are representing chromatin organization, and we are also adding a detection of a stimuli as a genes that are behaving in a different way. So in a normal state, we will have normal expression of these genes, normal levels of proteins uh, uh, of these genes. However, when we introduce tributyltin, we alter a nuclear genome organization. And with that alteration, there is also an alteration on the level of the level of expression of genes involved in metabolic processes and also in chromatin organization, which is going to alter those two um, traits. By altering uh, the amount of proteins involved in chromatin organization, we hypothesize that, that uh, those alterations of those proteins are going to be propagated uh, from mitosis um, and through mitosis and meiosis, and that can be propagated not only within the same animal in different tissues, but also across generation from one generation to the next. So we hypothesize that there is a self-reconstruction model that is conserving these alterations through mitosis and meiosis. So the next question that we are interested in is about what are the initial events that are leading to transgenerational effects? So we started looking into what is happening in this F0 when we expose the animals to um, to environmental factors like tributyltin. So the first experiment that uh, I did was to actually expose, uh, following the experimental setup that I um, uh, had followed before. And the idea was to expose the animals to TBT and then in the F1 generation during embryogenesis, isolate primordial germ cells or PGCs that are going to lead to the second generation. And then to tackle um, chromatin uh, organization, we were actually analyzing chromatin accessibility via ATAXIC. So when we did this experiment, we uh, found uh, doing principal component analysis, we found that animals uh, that came from the control group clustered together pretty well and separated from the animals that uh, came from uh, tributyltin exposure. However, we found that there are some differences uh, depending the, the, mm, the response was very spread in the TBT group. And something that happened in this experiment that was out of my control is that there were some samples some animals uh, whose mothers were exposed to uh, tributyltin for uh, between two and five weeks uh, before mating. So when I looked carefully at this data, I found that those um, PGCs that came from mothers that were exposed to tributyltin before conception for two or three weeks clustered closer to the control samples than those that came from mothers that were exposed for four or five weeks. So this was a key element to actually start thinking about the effect of preconception exposure to environmental factors. That, how can that, that contribute to multigenerational disease? So um, this is where uh, we are actually connecting with the pilot grant that uh, I was awarded from um, from UCSF uh, from their center. So some work that was done in the lab, some preliminary work that was done in the lab by Carlos Diaz Castillo uh, was to actually study different environment, the effect of preconception exposure to different environmental factors. So he was using TBT because it's the chemical that we know 
the best. Uh, we were using hypercaloric diets just to step away a little bit from chemicals and try to understand how other factors may be contributing to these effects. And we also looked into naturally occurring um, chemicals like arsenic. And when he did um, transcription analysis in a liver samples from the first generation, he actually found similar biases as those that was were shown when we did the previous experiment with the um, prenatal exposure. Uh, uh, so this is supporting the idea that preconception exposure is a key moment uh, for exposures that can have an impact in future generations. So we decided to actually um, capitalize on these findings and submit this uh, proposal for the pilot grants uh, at their center in 2020. Uh, and we proposed to do proteomic profiling. So the idea was that there could be proteins in the PGCs uh, that could be altered and that could contribute to subsequent alterations in the next generation in terms of a um, uh, higher order uh, chromatin structure. So uh, our proposal uh, included the use of arsenic, TBT, and different diets uh, during preconception. And then we will uh, mate the females with an exposed males and then um, isolate PGCs uh, of, in the F1 embryos and do proteomic profiling. So of course we had the amazing help from Susan, Steven and Sammy that help us uh, to go through the whole process of preparing the samples and analyzing the data. We are still working on it and we don't have like all the definitive answers, but uh, it has been really remarkable how um, and they have been helping us understanding these processes. So just to give you a little bit more information, we use PGCs on embryonic day 13.5. We have three biological replicates per treatment and sex, and then we ship the samples to the proteomics facility uh, at their center. So the data that uh, we received uh, is kind of like represented here in this um, um, uh, heat map. So we did some unsupervised uh, clustering uh, analysis of the samples. Uh, so the first um, uh, point that I want to highlight is that it was technically successful. So we were a little worried, us and also Susan and Steven and Sami, because the number of cells that we have, uh, the number of PCs is very limited. So we were worried about not having enough protein uh, in the sample to uh, analyze it, but we were successful on that. So that was like a really great result from the whole experiment. Um, another important thing is that uh, this uh, clustering as, and supervised clustering separates kind of well like females and males. So if you see separate this line, there are two different clusters here. And on the left, uh, there is uh, significant enrichment in female samples. And on the right, sorry, on the right, there is an enrichment on uh, male samples. Of course, there is some... Um, a spillage uh, because this type of complex analysis are never perfect, but I think it's very remarkable, this um, separation. And another interesting thing is that uh, in this right uh, cluster, uh, this, um, uh, there is like two sub subclusters uh, and the one on the left is actually showing the three samples that come from males from the total Western diet exposure. So it seems that it has the, the proteomic profiling of those samples are, is very different compared to um, the other samples uh, that were analyzed. So we were very excited about that. We are still working on the analysis uh, of these samples, but in parallel to this um, study, we actually found an opportunity to uh, start working with single cell cell RNA-seq. So we decided to do kind of like a similar approach to uh, expose, do preconception exposure. In this case, it was also only arsenic and control because uh, we had a limitation on the number of samples that we could um, uh, um, um, analyze. Uh, so we took um, the gonads, not only the PECs, we took the whole gonads, the embryonic gonads uh, of the F1, and then do single cell RNA-seq in males and females to replicate per, per treatment and per sex. So the information is captured here, like the, the whole uh, data is captured in this um, cloud of clusters. 
Uh, so it is in, uh, introducing the two treatments and the two sexes. So if we look carefully about, um, if we separate by, by a sample, we can actually identify the two sexes. And this line is intending to separate the two sexes. So there is a very good separation of the sample depending on the sex. So the upper right is representing female samples and the lower left is representing male samples. So we think that is kind of like a very interesting point. When we were looking specifically about PGCs, uh, we identified these clusters as PGCs based on a uh, expression of tassel. And when we looked more carefully here, we actually found that uh, the animals that were exposed to arsenic, uh, the samples from the animals, the PEC's clustered differently compared to the controls. So here, the arsenic samples in males are represented in red and brown, and they kind of like separate from the gray and um, orange that are the control samples. In the case of females, I think it's also very interesting that these uh, green represent arsenics and separates pretty well from uh, the pink and blue that uh, are the control samples. In the case of females, the other arsenic sample, we picked up very few uh, number of cells. So it's not showing very well in this uh, representation. So the next steps that we have is to actually do some data integration work to continue working with uh, both the proteomic and the single cell RNA uh, sequencing data and to try to integrate both uh, data sets to do some isocore based analysis, uh, the same type of analysis that we have done in the past to actually evaluate um, nuclear genome organization. And we are actually working on a grant proposal that will be capitalizing on these findings and also in the techniques, uh, like the fact that we can do proteomics with the help of, of course, the facility and also a single cell RNA-seq. So um, uh, just to uh, wrap things up a little bit, um, I just want to highlight like the importance of focusing on the preconception um, a, a window of exposure. And something that we are uh, working on is to actually focus on the germline of the F0 right now. So we have a little bit of funding to do that. Uh, and I just want to uh, show you kind of like what is our model for epigenetics. Um, uh, uh, for preconception exposures. So in our regular, so these uh, uh, cartoons are trying to represent uh, the different stages in embryogenesis and uh, post-embryonic development uh, the, and the different uh, cell types, uh, depending on the embryonic layer and the germline. And uh, also in this, um, the square kind of like represents the overall phenotype of the individual. So in a normal status, there is going to be normal development and uh, nothing exciting to highlight. If we are exposing animals during pregnancy only, we may be affecting one or two uh, cell types depending, or many, uh, depending on the moment of the exposure, and that can lead to one particular phenotype, but not necessarily all the cells are going to be affected in the same way. In our um, model for a preconception exposure, we are actually uh, exposing the F0 and our hypothesis is that we are going to be affecting the germline. And this alteration is actually going to affect the whole development uh, of the embryo of the next generation. And that is going to be propagated uh, throughout mitosis, throughout life, leading to an overall phenotype. So in the case, of my original experiments, we, we saw uh, alterations in liver, fat tissue, MSCs, and also primordial germ cells. Uh, so there is going to be an overall alteration on uh, how the genome is being affected. So uh, continuing with this idea, uh, by exposing the F0 uh, generation, uh, we may not only affect the germline, but also the the somatic tissues of the mother, and that can affect the subsequent um, development of on the embryo. So of the embryo. So something that we are working on right now, in the um, in the lab, is to actually. Um, perform experiment to rule out the maternal contribution to the phenotype that we are seeing. So we are exposing preconceptionally and then uh, we want to do in vitro fertilization and uh, to transfer the embryos to an unexposed mom to actually see what the results are. We are also analyzing ovarian somatic and germ, and germ cells. And uh, we are also starting to work with paternal preconception exposures to actually identify the contribution of the parent, of the fathers. Um, so 
To conclude, something that I just wanted to uh, highlight is that we tend to think when we think about environmental exposures, we we tend to think about ourselves, right? Like we don't want to be exposed to that. The next thing we think about is our future generations. Uh, any exposure that we are receiving during certain windows of susceptibility may be affecting our kids and our grandkids. We need to keep in mind that um, we are uh, exposed to many different factors, but our kids and our grandkids are uh, will receive their very own exposome that is also going to contribute to their health. But something that is very critical is to actually keep in mind that we are also affected by the exposomes of our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, and that is something that we cannot control. But it would be great to actually understand a little bit so we could explain some of the diseases that are persistent uh, right now. So going back to the original um, a slide about restricting and banning some of the chemicals, I think it's great. I think it's work that is needed. Is uh, you know, uh, and it is. All this is happening because of the work that we are doing, uh, but we need to keep in mind that it can have last, long lasting effects across generations. And it is important that we keep doing what we are doing, I think, um, to actually um, um, uh, explain uh, certain human diseases. And with that, I just would like to thank you all for your attention. And also, you know, of course, everybody in my lab that is uh, making um, everything happen. And also my collaborators, Diana, Upasna, and Camila, that are being great. And we are receiving really great feedback. And of course, our funding. Without our funding, we cannot do what we are doing. So uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, very interesting. Um, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, I, well, I think people could put some questions in the chat. I wonder, I'm seeing a lot of applause um, for you. I wonder, are there, um, I, I wanted to see if Susan, yeah, Susan is on the, um, on the call. Susan, I wonder if you'd like to comment at all on the, uh, the proteomics core and how this helped this project. Sure, I'd be happy to comment. It's really fun to see the data. So this is a, an extremely good example of what proteomics is good for. In, in the early days of mass spectrometry-based global proteomic identifications, I know that's uh, saying a lot, <laughs> but that's what this is. Um, it was mostly used for protein identification. You know, what's in this sample versus what's in another sample. But we're getting to the point now where we can do more quantitative analyses to say this sample not only has different protein contents, but it has more of a protein. And I wanted to point out that the protein uh, analyses are really important. Uh, we have done these experiments ourselves in placental cells, but many people have done the experiments I'm going to talk about in different kinds of cells. And it, most people, I think, who don't study this are quite shocked to find out that RNA levels have less than a 50% correlation with protein levels in most cells. So we're getting a very incomplete picture of what's going on in a cell if we study only the RNA and not the protein too. Uh, this is especially true because the proteins are the major workers uh, in our cells. So that's why proteomic analyses are so important and why we think it's important as as a P30 core and to study the effects of toxicants. Thanks, Susan. Um, and I, uh, let's see, oh, Diane, I was gonna see if you wanted to say anything. I see you just put something in the chat. Would you like to mention that? And um, I see that Linda Burman was very impressed as I think we all were with your very beautiful slides. So <laughs> Diana, would you like to comment? 
Sure. Sorry. I'm having to be on two different Zooms for our animal facility right now, um, but the other one just ended. So my question, Raquel, um, it's a really beautiful talk that you gave. And my question was about your chromatin organization model, which I really like. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen some preliminary data presented from other labs, including, I think, Bruce Bloomberg's. So hopefully you know about this that in exposure models to um, to various chemicals in mice, they're seeing differences with high C um, results that suggest that the chromatin contacts are changing based on the um, on exposures. And I'm wondering if, do you think that that could also be happening? Um, do you think that they're part of the same process? Uh, and are you, so how are you thinking about this and are you planning to do something like high C as well? Yes, so we are actually uh, planning on doing that. Yeah, I'm aware of the uh, work that Bruce is um, is doing and and the, so and the data he has. So, uh, yeah, they found that with TBT um, that there are like differences in certain regions uh, when they are comparing TVT and doing, uh, when they are comparing TVT and DMSO uh, doing high C. We actually have funding to do the similar analysis um, using nicotine. So some of the projects um, that we are developing in the lab are involving uh, nicotine exposures, and we are having we are seeing similar phenotypes as those that I have described with arsenic, uh, total western diet and TVT. Uh, which I think is very interesting because of the conservation of the phenotypes that we are um, seeing, depend, you know, independent of uh, the chemical. So something that we are going to do is to use high C um, to look into primordial gem cells. Uh, so we have some funding to do that. And we are trying to also... We are considering doing uh, that also in somatic tissues um, just to kind of like map... Uh, comparisons between the germline and the um, somatic tissues of affected uh, tissues in metabolic processes. So uh, that is a hypothesis that we have that that is actually occurring and uh, is in our plans to to do some high C in some of the tissues. Yep. Looks like we're running out of time here. Um, I uh, wonder if, uh, uh, Alana, if you wanted to get any last words, I see you put in another pitch for um, our RAP awards. And this is clearly illustrates how we're pleased that we can make a contribution to this line of inquiry. So Alana, any last words? I, I think Peggy, you said it best. So thank you all for attending and Raquel, thank you so much for um, your time and information and for uh, also just being such an excellent Earth Center awardee. Um, Thank we appreciate you. it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I appreciate the, the support from their center and, you know, all, all, yeah, all the support at all levels. <laughs> it has been really, really fun and really nice. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.